Hi, Claudia. Hi. Hi. Targini, is that how you pronounce? <laughs> no. Uh, Targini. Targini. I was like, Any kid in school, we used to be ragged because nobody gets my name right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very I much have, used to it. <laughs> yeah, I have the same problem in Brazil. <laughs> No one, no one can say it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us today and, and welcome. Uh, is this the first dialogue session you joined? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. My name is Stefania. I am uh, an ambassador at Dialogues One. I'm responsible for a vertical call after Babel mm -hmm. together with uh, Breno. And then after Babel, we used the uh, dialogue as a format to explore the sources of creativity. So let's be creative. We're going to change things a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so this dialogue session is about embodied resonance. Quite of a tricky, tricky words, tricky words. But uh, what I mean by that is the connection between motion and emotion. So motion and emotion are intrinsically connected. One is moved by movement, perception, impression, and one is also moved by, is the move to move, action and expression. So through resonance, our body functions as a medium for our emotions. So we act, we express ourselves based on our perceptions and our impressions. So each one of you will, will have the chance to share a moment in your life you felt deep emotion. It can be any moment. This is a safe space, a moment you experienced a long time ago, a moment you experienced recently. The idea is to focus on the experience itself and why you felt deep emotion. So now how you may or may have not acted upon your emotion, but the experience itself. Um, and the good thing is that we are different people. We live in different realities. We experience things differently. So let's lean on that. Let's use that. Um, and I think when we talk about our emotions, it's of course extremely important that we remember the the three principles of dialogue. So be brief and precise, speak from the heart and listen as you would like to be heard. And after actively listening to the one sharing, we will dialogue about what we heard using the talking piece. Remember, you've probably seen the video. I like to use an imaginary talking piece, but <clears throat> You can use any any object that is uh, it's near you. Do you have any questions? No, it's clear. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds good. Um, I would like to 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 take a moment now, just uh, uh, just to reflect on that uh, moment in your life you felt uh, deep emotion. So let's take a couple minutes. Uh, uh, by ourselves to just uh, think about that. And when the time is up, I'll let you know.
Are we ready to start or do you want a few more minutes? Yeah, I think I'm ready. Yeah. You ready? Sounds good. Since it's the, only the three of us, uh, I will also join the dialogue and will also share. Um, but perhaps I shouldn't be the first one. So <laughs> who would like to start? I can go. So the guiding, um, guide, the guiding question again, just so you remember, what was a moment in your life you felt deep emotion? And I will share here on the chat as well. Okay, um, it's actually very recent. And, and it was knowing and going through the death of my two granddads. Do you want me to elaborate on it, or is this a good enough answer? <laughs> you can you can elaborate if you're comfortable to do so. Okay. Um, well, obviously, it, you know, it's it's probably one of the hardest um, emotions to deal with, and it's layered, so it's actually a lot of things happening at the same time. But I would say that um, I think that the hardest thing was the fact that it happened during a particular time in our lives and the world is living this massive lockdown. And so we couldn't say goodbye. So we couldn't say goodbye to them. And I guess that for the first time in my life, I felt the importance of goodbye rituals associated to death. So I, I'd never placed much importance to them. I always felt that they were a little bit void. I didn't understand why. And not being able to, to go through it properly actually was like a, a big ha-ha moment for me. Thank you so much for, for sharing, Claudia. The guiding question now for the ones listening, Sarjani and I, is how does that resonate with you? So how does that resonate with me? I can, I can start sharing. I'll grab the, the talking piece before I do that. Um, I lost my okay. uh, grand grandmother two years back, um, and she was very, very close to me, very important to me. And um, it wasn't in a time where we couldn't meet, but I couldn't possibly be there for her as she was going through the last moments of her life and uh, and the ritual of of her passing because I was living abroad. And in Brazil, everything happened so quickly that it wasn't enough time for me to, to be there. And uh, it was, uh, it's, it's, it stuck, it really changed uh, the experience for me. I felt more distant, more disconnected uh, with my, my family and with her than than ever before, and uh, a sense of uh, helplessness, helplessness, such a hard word. Um, even though the, we know the person has passed and you're there for the family, you're there for the friends, you're there for the community, there is, uh, there is something about the presence and the experience of that ritual. Perhaps it's not for the person, but perhaps it's for you. So I can I can definitely resonate with that uh, with that feeling. It's a hard one, and I know that many people are experiencing it now due to the current situation. 
and I and I actually now that you talk about it, I wonder if much has been done actually to deal with this. I mean, we have so many people out there in the world who are experiencing something something similar and uh, maybe there was an opportunity to connect with each other uh, uh, and hold hands even virtually to to be there for each other in this moment yeah thank you I um If if we uh, sorry um, even though there was no like technically like a direct loss, but uh, whenever I was moving around in the city, and Mumbai is like one of the den densest cities, right? And then this curfew and all happened, and every time I saw people moving around because you could just see when you're wearing a mask, you could just see eyes, right? And uh, people just passing by you and just, you know, that glimpse in their eyes that, so you don't know what that person is going through, but just looking at their eyes, you know that, you know, something is up. Otherwise, if the normal crowd, if I would judge moving around in the pandemic time, people are, were either cautious of, you know, not coming near each other or just rushing around. But then there were a lot of, people who were anxious or you know processing some grief so like that has been like a consistent memory of me moving around in the city in this past one year and uh, somehow those eyes certain eyes that i have seen they have sort of stayed with me uh, so and it it's made me question a lot that uh, how much our lives in you know somehow get defined by where we are where we get born at or what are the re resources around us and a lot of things which are unfair and you know it just could not be like i could not just ignore it anymore like i'm trying to process it every day i try to write it out but uh, yeah Pre-pandemic, the when you saw certain inequalities or certain grief of people around you, you accepted it as a part of life, and you know that's how things are. Even though you, like, for example, we are educated to be conscious and sensitive towards it, but no one has really taught us to process it and how do we contribute to you know really to people around us. So these are some of the factors that I'm always constantly thinking on. And somehow when I move around, like eyes are, I mean, it just feels like eyes speak a lot nowadays. Just what you shared also resonated with me for the fact that um, when when the pandemic started and the whole counting started, it I don't think ever in my life I have felt so much anxiety. Just seeing that number increase, 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 and spread and spread and spread, it was like being on a roller coaster that never ends and uh and 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 just urging for it to stop and and it's still going i'm i'm very glad that they stopped to do to do this uh, counting <laughs> in in yeah in every every newspaper that you that you accessed uh, but uh, or read but it was it was uh it was this feeling that you that you mentioned about um something we're not taught to deal with. Like, how do we, how do we go about uh, experiencing uh, uh, the divide in society, this, the extent of inequality 
and you know the 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 differences between how people experience something that it is reaching out at every single corner of the world and seeing this evolving in real time and having little i mean little to do little to to act on it unless stay home and not do anything mm -hmm. so this 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 feeling gave me so much uh anxiety for the for the first couple of months i really felt that i you know I, even though I knew I needed to be home and I needed to take care of myself and not to put others in risk, it was super struggling for me not to do anything, not to go out there. I was uh, I was in Lisbon at the time, and um, and there are a lot of homeless people living on the streets, and and a lot of elderly people living on the streets. So I felt okay. I mean, I can cook some food in my home and then go out there and 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 uh, and distribute i mean at least this will somewhat help with the situation and and i started to talk to people who wants to join me let's do this uh, uh i can put some here you can but everyone was saying this is the worst thing you can do now i mean you might have covid and then you're you know you're sharing the food with others who are at risk and and I realized that was indeed a stupid thing to do, at least at that time that I did, people didn't know exactly how to you know how to protect. I mean now this can be done. You know better how to how to prepare the food so it's safe, and you know better how to keep a distance and you wear the mask and etc. But this feeling of not being able to do anything and not uh, 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 in the sense of not being prepared for the moment uh, was was really, really, really powerful. Um, <clears throat> Tajani, thank you for for what you shared <clears throat> because you brought you brought up um, this very powerful idea. I, I've I've thought about that as well. You know, the, the fact that we can only see uh, people's eyes when we cross with them in the street and, and for some reason, I don't know how this how this comes to be, but when you cover part of your face and, and the eyes are the only part that is showing, again, I have, I had this sort of confirmation of something that you, that you've heard, you know, all your life that the eyes are the, the mirror of the soul and you, you, and, and and you sort of listen to this and you remember some episodes where, yes, you were talking to someone and that person, just the look in his or her eyes, you just could see inside that person's soul. But now that expression actually has got like a completely different meaning. Um, and the eyes suddenly have become like the only way for some people to communicate because the rest of their face is, is, is covered. Um, so it kind of resonated with me when you said that when you're walking in Mumbai and you can see and some of the looks stay with you and that's pretty powerful. Um, but at the same time, as you were saying this and as Stefania is mentioning the emotions that she's gone through um, and how we're not taught to, to deal with these things, we're not taught to deal with the inequalities and we're not even thought to deal with the emotions. And sometimes I feel that we even lack the vocabulary to fully express our emotions. And that's one of the things that I've learned like in the past year, sometimes I want to look inside and to really understand what is going on with me, what am I feeling? And I keep going back to the same words. Um, and sometimes, I think that there must be other words to express what I'm feeling. I just don't have them. And I don't have them because we are not um, um, empowered or stimulated enough to, to look inside and to just ask these kind of questions. What is it? What is it that I'm feeling? What is it that this emotion is prompting me to do? Um, 
And I think that's, that's um, I don't know, I think that's powerful too. And, and it could be one of the reasons why so many people struggle to talk about how they feel because the language is missing. I've forgotten who has, you know, written this quote, but uh, it was there in one of, uh, like, one of the architecture books that I was studying in college. And Claudia, just as you were speaking, it about you know how we can't express and how we don't have the vocabulary. It it like sort of like really flashed before my eyes right now. Uh, the quote was that if you put a frog in a hot water pan and you slowly and slowly are increasing the heat the frog won't know right away until it's very late and he just dies in a state of euphoria so i i feel that somehow at least for mumbai i feel that the the stimulation is 100 percent all the time day or night it's there but I, I feel that people maybe mm -hmm. choose not to feel those things or not really process them because they feel powerless that even if they feel those emotions, how are they going to process it? What is really, at an individual level, what is really going to come out of it? So, like, even I'm, I always struggle with these verticals because I don't know somehow for example in like somehow i'm in like my student days right now sorry uh this when you are taught to you know build things design uh streets or buildings and somehow this idea that you know of being like a savior that you know design for equality uh, equity design for good design for empowerment all of these uh, things are there but then I have always struggled. How can it be that this lingo just exists in my, like, you know, in our own bubble? Like, if it's to be so well meaning and so it should really impact people around me, why am I or a lot of other people not able to communicate these to, like, the general crowd around? Like, the, so for example, for me, my line gets blurred between. Like, because on a professional level, I go in that direction uh, through the research initiatives that have been engaged in. So, and then I struggle to come out of this because you have to, like, you know, somewhere draw a line of what's, like, maybe personal and what's professional and what's the outside world out there. If, if those lines are, like, constantly blurred around you, it's like you are a state of mess and which I feel, I mean, I don't deny it and I never hide it also before anyone, be it a goddamn interview or, you know, doing any public speaking or any damn thing. But I, I, I don't know how to process these and I'm trying to learn from people around me, but I feel that it's not, I don't know how it's not given that importance, I feel like everyone is doing their own roles right but where do our roles sort of come together and inform each other especially on larger things like this sorry i i know i was very i think random and i was like i think going around in 10 different not at all what you shared was so beautiful thank you thank you you could have continued. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> Do you think this is a good time for for you to share a moment in your life that you felt deep emotion? I I would like some like it's Sometimes. rattling me a bit inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe I can share. Um, it's actually related uh, to the pandemic as well. 
uh, I wasn't really thinking I was going to share anything. I thought I was going to facilitate. So, yeah, but the, the second I said it, uh, the question out loud, um, I thought about that moment. Um, as soon as it started, I have been living abroad for around 10 years now, and I'm only 30. So it's been a big chunk of my life. And uh, yeah, it's been difficult to, to, to deal with the, with the distance, but yet I have uh, built some, some strength and have been able to, you know, get my act together and uh, start my own life and, and build my family everywhere I go and, uh, and et cetera. But, um, but as soon as it, it hit and the lockdown started and, you know, all the news came out, uh, still didn't know what it was and, and how long it would take and, we still don't know, but <laughs> but it was everything so new. Uh, I started to get uh, messages and calls from from distant relatives that I hadn't I hadn't spoken to in ten years. Friends that I didn't even think that remembered me, and people were calling me. Are you okay? Where are you? Uh, is everything okay with you? Uh, I'm good. My family is good. I just wanted to let you know. And that for me was, I, I you know, I really felt uh, a, a deep sense of uh, uh, emotional connection. Like I'd never experienced before. I mean, this whole time I felt that, you know, I had gone off my, my own way and no one really cared. And but then suddenly, you know, because of it, uh, I actually felt more connected uh, than ever before with people who I, you know, hadn't spoken to in 10 years. So, yeah, it really made me stop and think uh, about the relationships we build in life. I think because it's so easy now to, you know, send a WhatsApp message or say hi on Instagram, Facebook, and etc. You forget that relationships are not about you know those quick connections you make. They are about the moments you shared. And no matter how long ago this was, the rela the relationship is built and will last for a lifetime. Yeah. So that was. Uh, that was the moment I felt deep, deep emotion. And I'd like to ask you, how does that resonate with you? Um, <clears throat> well, I actually felt emotional when you when when you, when you were saying when you were telling that particular situation that happened to you uh i don't know there was i felt the emotion in you and it kind of sort of transpired onto onto me um and i guess that maybe it helped that um I'm surprisingly for me, I, I've managed to build some really deep connections with people, you know, last year, um, virtual connections, people that I, you know, I've never met them perso in person and I'm not sure if I will ever meet them, but I actually learned something about the, re the about human relationships that, that I was very, sort of close to, I didn't actually believe that you can feed, a, a, you know, a positive and a strong relationship from a distance. Um, so in the past, I was sort of very, um, 
I didn't like to, you know, to do Skypes and FaceTimes and things like that because I just, you know, I just felt, what's the point? I mean, it's not the same thing as being with a person. I was the worst person. And now I've, I've, I've known and I've, I speak to people and I have interactions, frequent interactions with people now that, you know, a year ago I didn't, I didn't know them. And it, it sort of showed me that the quality of a relationship, the quality is in something that's quite intangible. It, it's not related to where you are. It's not related to even if you're close, like if you can grab the person and, um, and it's, it's got to do with having memories, creating powerful memories. It's got to do with intuition. It's got to do with energy. Um, and so I discovered that you can have meaningful relationships, quality relationships from a distance. And yes, that they can be dormant and you think they're gone. And then in a moment where our emotions are, are sort of struck to the core and you, and you fear for losing, you, fe you, you actually fear for losing some people in your lives, everything just rushes back and you just, and you just want to make sure that that person is okay. It's pretty powerful. I'm glad that you went through that, Stefania, because maybe you thought that these people were maybe lost and they're not because some relationships, you cannot break them. They, they can just be dormant for years. You can break them. <laughs> I sort of have something, like my experience has been very opposite in fact, like, um, I mean, I, anyway, I'm like more of an introverted person, but so yeah, in the, for example, in the first month and a half of the pandemic, when they were like announcing that now it's 15 days, now it's 21 days. So in that time, because there was no, like, you know, like, uh, work pressure or you, you didn't know how things are going to work out basically, or what are you expected to do? So in that time, the phase happened that I somehow spoke to people I've not spoken out in years. But then I sort of completely went into my shell. Like, the, so there, there were times wherein there were there have been messages, but I've responded like after like two three days. Like even right now, I have messages that I've not like I've. I've not been like, you know, active in, and I, I know it's not a good thing, but I constantly in the past one year, I have been feeling that in these anxious times, if I don't have something meaningful or good, I can contribute, then I don't want to be a rock. And that has been the reason that I've like really cut off maybe, but in the hindsight, now I feel that Sometimes you have to allow people to be there for you also and not really close off this much. So yeah, it's these things I'm still processing right. Like now that we are discussing is when I'm realizing it also. The importance of dialogue, I think. It's, I mean, Claudia mentioned before that, you know, sometimes it, you don't have the words, but for me, it, it's only when I start to speak that the words come to me and the, I mean, and the reflections as well. So it's so important that we find uh, space for dialogues to happen, uh, no matter what is the topic at hand, because that's really that's really powerful for you to make sense of uh, of your feelings and 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 the realities and to 
that you're living in. I've noticed we have only a couple minutes left. Um, we can spend the rest of this uh, dialogue however we want. Tajani, you can uh, share with us if you feel comfortable sharing, or we can check out and talk about the experience of a home as a whole. It's up to, to you. Experience as a home. Yeah, it's, sorry, what did you say? It was so. I was saying experience as a whole. Okay, perfect. Let's do that. Let's let's talk about. Perhaps let's share about the uh, yeah dialogue as uh, as I was saying, as this tool for us to connect in different parts of the world, talking about something that you wouldn't normally talk even to the closest people to you. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Can I make uh, mm -hmm. one observation? Like, uh, so the world was brimming with news, right? The past one year now, almost. And uh, yeah, so even though, like, every week there was some news or the other, whether it, Apart from COVID also, a lot of other news used to sort of blow up because people were like at it compared to like a normal routine. And uh, I really struggled to sort of have a conversation because somehow I felt that like why, why were we getting more polarized in a time wherein we should actually have been like, you know, coming together even more stronger. So why was it constantly being like, uh, I think this is right. I think uh, this news is correct. Like it was a lot of like I and personal opinion and and it's like there's nothing wrong about personal opinion. But where did we sort of, why did we sort of stop having that line wherein we acknowledge that if I'm forming some personal opinion due to my certain experiences and belief system, the opposite person is also doing the same, right? So rather than just constantly being in our, like, you know, separate bubbles, how come, like, you know, why have there not been attempts to sort of fuse and understand and learn from one another? Like, like why does news always, like, have these hot debates which are sold off for like TRPs and what not, but like, and it, it infiltrated at every level, like in personal social circles, or maybe it was the way our anxiety, you know, collective anxieties were also playing up. Like every person has had their own sort of struggle, but yeah, like somehow I, I felt that as surprising certain kind acts were, world also seemed a bit more polarized this year compared to any other year. Like in the beginning, how people were very uh, excited that now we realize that we have to look after our climate because city air quality became better after like a month of lockdown and people were excited for that new normal and, you know, we'll get better and work towards a better future. But now, one year into it, and no end in sight, and everyone is, because of course, everyone is struggling to sort of make do and survive. That, I mean, again, like, still processing things. Um. <clears throat> I wish I had the answers for all of your questions, Sarjani. I don't. Um, but I do, and, and building on what Stephanie has said, um, and as a way, almost like my checkout, I do believe that one of the most powerful tools that we have to, for example, untangle the polarization 
is through dialogue and through conversation. Um, it's very rare for people to actually get together and do what we are doing here, where there is a lot of listening and there's not judgment, there is no judgment. So if we could have more spaces like these in our normal daily lives, I think we would see an incredible transformation in a lot of things. And I have looked for spaces of dialogue um, during the pandemics and I've looked for them because they do help me make sense of the world. They help me build and rebuild my own system of beliefs. I find that I, I can actually sometimes understand things better through the eyes of others um, and that others sometimes have the words that I lack and that is amazing mm. and i think it's it's a problem solving tool it's um it's a spiritual reckoning tool it's um conversation this ability to just you know connect to other human beings and just listen and exchange and share and create these safe spaces where people just feel that they can be who they are and that they can express themselves. It's, I think, it, it could be like the next level of evolution for us. It's amazing how we some, somehow unlearned how to do this. I don't know if we ever knew how to do this, but it's to me that we've unlearned how to do it. And it's urgent that we learn how to do it again. I can only agree. Um, I feel like I'm gonna repeat myself. <laughs> I'm gonna repeat you, like, sorry. But uh, yeah, I, uh, the words, yeah, your words just uh, resonated with everything I believe in. Um, I don't think we can ever evolve from the situation we are now without uh, exchange and interchange uh, of thoughts, beliefs and actions. and and, and whether that is uh, through dialogue or any other format, um, it must happen one way or another. And I feel that um, at least what I experience is, you know, the, the world is getting more and more heated. We are bombarded with more and more news and we feel like we know a lot about everything, uh, but we don't. Uh, our belief system, <laughs> it's based on headlines nowadays. <laughs> mm -hmm. Scroll downs and uh, headlines, uh, uh, you know, in, in different media outlets or social media. A lot of this is fake, a lot of it is true but it's condensed in a couple a couple words and we feel like we know. I know what you're feeling in India because I know what's the situation in Mumbai. I just read a, you know, a report mm -hmm. of what's happening there. And um, I think this is so dangerous. This is so dangerous. And I really feel that, you know, we, we have to go uh, uh against the current here. like we have to uh swim in the opposite direction of the river flow to be able to find those spaces where you know i can connect to someone that is in a part of the world and try to get an understanding of what is that what that's that person's uh, reality about and feel like i shouldn't you know, and, 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 and sort of make sense of the fact that a headline on an, on a, on an article will not give me that. So I'm, um, yeah, that's something I've been, been thinking a lot about. And uh, 
and being trying to find spaces and I appreciate this space a lot because of it. I somehow like no. I present. Hello. Yeah. yeah, that's better. Thanks. Impulsively, somehow, I write things out uh, in order to process them. And the way you said right now of how how can you know from a headline of what the other person's reality is? So sometimes we are uh, consuming more information as a consumption rather than you know knowledge for absorption so when we are reading like you know like mindlessly scrolling or i think like to sort of remind consciously that you know is this headline just like i try to do that that is this headline just triggering me is there any way i'm going to process it or so i have days wherein like i am on linkedin or instagram or uh, news apps like for three four hours on my phone and then there are like weeks wherein i have not opened them also like one of the apps so i because it becomes like an escape also when we are just constantly consuming information thinking that we are increasing our knowledge on things but we, we are not really that information that we are consuming is sometimes also like a distraction from things which are happening like right around you like so that is what like i constantly try and remind myself that don't consume information as a consumption uh, method but rather read through things to absorb it so like it's helping like fe me feel like less anxious uh it's like a coping mechanism basically right now because we are not going anywhere we're like we are still a lot of us are still privileged that we are able to work from home so that virtual space that we engage with we are like like i'm like so i realized that i was so mindlessly scrolling and it was more of a distraction i was not doing anything that was actually increasing my awareness about any thing around so getting that slowness in life is something that i'm like being conscious about now Maybe I can share. Um, so this is the second dialogue today that uh, that I'm a guardian, and the first one was about uh, bridging divides, uh, the divides of our consciousness. So we spoke about uh, <clears throat> the divide between the body and the mind, the awareness of the self. And, and, and divide between people, the awareness of the social body. And as you were, when you were, uh, uh, when I was listening to you just now, I was thinking exactly about that. How can you, how can you be aware of your social body when you're not aware of yourself? It's, it cannot be done. Um, we have an amazing opportunity now to get insights uh, into everything that is going on in the world. We can. It's at the tip of our fingers. But it's escape at the same time, as you said. It takes one away from its own self, from its own awareness 
and the responsibility to do something here and now for those that you, you know, that are part of your system, that are affected but by, by what you do and you're affected by what they do. So I could, uh, yeah, I think uh, it really resonated with, with me and in connection with uh, the dialogue we had earlier today as well. Thank you. I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I ever called it an escape, you know, just engaging in, in reading and in trying to, to cram in as much information as one can. Um, but maybe it is an escape because not doing it means that you have to sit with yourself and you have to sit with your thoughts and you have to sit with your feelings and your emotions, the, the same ones that you can't understand, that you can process. And I, I think it's just, a, maybe it's evolutionary, it's a biological thing, or, or I don't know many human beings that actually like to sit in a state of discomfort or confusion or ambiguity. You just kind of tend to, to run away from it. But maybe that's something that we've been doing wrong because now that, that we are facing one of the most ambiguous and uncertain time of our lives, we were completely caught off guard. I mean, no one knew what, what to do. People were going crazy just for the sheer fact of not knowing when the lockdowns are going to end, of, kind of losing that sense of control that some people really find that it's important for them to make sense of the world. And um, I've, been, I've been thinking recently about this. I, I heard this amazing podcast by a, a Belgian author called Frédéric Laloux. And um, he, he's written this really famous book about reinventing businesses and organizations. But I think that now he's kind of moved on a little bit from that and he's doing and he's sort of deep diving in another line of work. And he's actually going into the biggest discomfort that there is, which is to reflect about integrity and how integrous we are in our lives and how is it that our integrity or lack of integrity is impacting everyone around us and the world. And, and one of the things that he does with the people that he works with is to actually invite them to sit with the hard questions. Sit with them. Don't try to find an answer. Don't even feel that you are the one that has to find the answer. Just stay there and sit with it. And he, he finds and he, he, he's sort of in this podcast, he's talking about these people that he's working with, really powerful men that when they have to sit with these questions, they feel so powerless, so stripped of this sort of made up power that, 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 we, that we have in our systems of, of hierarchy and power. But I just find that it's kind of related with what Tarjani is saying. We just don't wanna sit with the hard questions and we just don't wanna sit with the discomfort. So we mindlessly and in a numb way, we just, scroll, 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 as in sort of distract me, distract me, just give me something that I can, you know, get my brain busy with so that it doesn't go into the dark or darker places. Just to build on that, uh... I think the buzzword at some point was information society. And I feel like we're moving to entertainment society. Our politicians are, you know, celebrities. And the information we consume is entertainment. And just way back in the beginning of this dialogue, that Sarjani, you mentioned, you know, all these words 
equity, equality, inclusion, and design for empowerment, those words, they lose meaning when information is entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, uh, this is where we are now. And how do we fight back to put the meaning in the words again, to not let, you know, organizations and people and the likes brainwash what is really important uh, for us. Because, I mean, it tends to, to increase. That's the, that's the reality we're seeing as the world gets more polarized. In uh, one of the dialogue that I, uh, I forgot the exact name of it, but just building on what you just said, the woman mentioned that how the words, like the language we use is, why why do we use language? We use it to communicate, right? But if that communicate has, uh, if that communication has certain, you know, other intentions behind just the meaning of the word. So for example, she spoke about how uh, we have sort of devalued the word community, for example. So community is taking care of each other having that circle wherein you grow together somehow uh, not like you know intellectually or uh, physically any anyhow uh, but when when we see in the information society when we see the word community for example thrown around that join our community and you'll get like an exclusive uh, sale uh, discounts so somehow like you said that design for empowerment when these when we sort of start using our language to just sound right or fancy or you know things like pretentious people who are actually using those words for the right intentions even they don't get that sort of not importance, but uh, attention, maybe. Because if if I'm a spectator and I have like 10 people in front of me, be it on, in the virtual space or in the physical space in the city around me, talking about what a community should be. and But none of them is, you know, coming back to that sort of core idea of, of what a community means we are just superficially using it so you sort of don't take that word that seriously anymore so that, that from that dialogue it it stayed with me like too much sorry i mean i didn't know if i was not supposed to repeat like it just you're fine <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I think we actually came to the end of it. It's, uh, yeah, it's 45 already. Um, and I, I mean, I, I really felt uh, uh, that we had a good time. I thank you so much for, for joining the session and dialoguing. Um, it went from, you know, highly emotional so <laughs> highly rational and highly philosophical. And I really like to see the differences uh, uh, throughout this, uh, yeah, this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish you a good uh, evening and uh, yeah, stay in yeah. touch. <laughs> Thank you to both of you. It was really nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>